This is a do-it-yourself NAS home server. It has an Intel Alder Lake N100 CPU, low powered, quite an operation, eight drive bays, which are easily accessible and can support up to 32 gigs of RAM. I'll go over all the parts and components needed for this build, how to put it all together, NAS software choice, and also a breakdown of cost to see if it was worth building a NAS enclosure like this, or picking up a Synology off the shelf system like this. Well, not this exact same one, this is my old Synology 4-bay NAS. At the time, costed around $545, and because I was outgrowing this particular NAS, I wanted to find out if it was worth continuing to upgrade and buy another Synology NAS with more drive bays, or build one. And you can probably figure out which route I took. So how much does a Synology 5-bay or 6-bay NAS cost? Well, for a 5-bay, it'll set you back $700, and a 6-bay NAS can set you back $900. And these prices are just enclosures. They don't include any hard disks. I think the cheapest Synology 6-bay NAS I found is the DS620 Slim, and that's around $450. So I wanted to see if I could build a NAS for around $500, $600, definitely under the $900, and the more drive bays, the merrier. And don't get me wrong, I do like Synology NAS systems, and they make, they make good systems. I just wanted to see if I can build something cheaper, something that shared some of the same qualities of the Synology NAS systems. For instance, being quiet, low-powered, small in form factor, and you can mix and match hard drive sizes just like Synology with their Synology hybrid RAID system. And something upgradable to some extent. Now I'm no PC building expert, but I have built a PC in the past, so it seemed like a good enough challenge. I mean, how hard can it be building a NAS system, right? right. First off, let's start with the case. This is the John's Book N3 case, and unfortunately, form factor-wise, the Synology clearly wins here in terms of form factor, but it does offer easy access to the hard drives, just like the Synology, which is a win here. And it's quite hard to come by with these PC cases. If you're aware of any, let me know in the comments below. Now, John's Book do have smaller cases like the N1 and N2. Now, the N2 case has easy access to the drives, just like the N3, and is much smaller. But there's a slight issue. The case fan that comes with it is loud, fine. But to replace it, you need a 3D printer to print a special mounting bracket so you can fit another standard size fan because the case fan that comes with it has a slimmer profile. And that's why I went with the N3 case. The plus side though, it has eight drive bays and it has two case fans, which you can just swap out easily. No 3D printer needed. And generally more breathing room for your components and a bit easier when it comes to installing the internal parts. And I have to say quality-wise, pretty good quality, solid metal frame all around. The front panel is plastic and magnetic. You can put it off, allowing you quick access to the hard drives. At the back, you get two case fans, and to open it, there are two thumb screws. You've got space for two PCI slots, and to open it up, there are two screws on each side, and you have plenty of ventilation grills. Price-wise, $190 from AliExpress includes taxes and shipping straight to the UK. Now motherboard wise, finding the right motherboard for a NAS home server proved to be more challenging than I thought. I came across the ASRock motherboard that had integrated CPU with low power consumption, but was limited to expansion capabilities and only supported eight gigs of RAM. Then there was the Gigabyte motherboard, which offered better memory support and expansion options, but finding a low powered CPU to buy even second hand was proving very difficult. Then I came across a motherboard brand that I've never heard of. The CWDOK N100 motherboard. This has integrated Intel N100 CPU with a very low power rating of 15 watts, integrated graphics, maximum memory support of up to 32 gigs of RAM, six SATA ports, which you don't see often, well, I haven't seen anyway, a PCI M2 slot, all for a cool price of 190 US dollars, including shipping. And first impressions, the motherboard does look legitimate, has all the ports and described on the website. And the one true test was seeing if it will turn on. But before that, let's talk fans, quiet fans. And opting for something quiet, I went for the Noctua low profile CPU fan. I picked this up from Amazon for 50 US dollars. And for replacing the case fans, I picked up another two Noctua three pin, 92 millimeter fans for $23 each. As for the RAM, nothing special since the motherboard has only one slot. I went for the 16 gig DDR5 RAM for $50. I could have gone for an eight gig or even four gig to save money here. Now power supply, what is a quiet and good PSU? 
Well, this is where I came across the Corsa SFX series. The SFX 450 and the SFX 600 were ideal, but there was another problem. They are very hard to come by. And even the SS 750 is difficult to buy, but with a bit of luck, I managed to pick up a very good condition one on eBay for a reasonable price of $96. And because the Johnsbo case has the ability to swap out hard drives, it has a SATA backplane, so I picked up a six-piece SATA cable from AliExpress for $10 to connect the hard drives. Now, I did also get hold of a one terabyte SSD for $90. Now, this isn't supposed to store data per se, but to act as a cache storage. And I'll go into why it'll make more sense when it comes to the choice of NAS software. And all that comes to a total cost of $722, give or take for a few dollars for currency conversion. It's clearly not cheaper than the cheapest six bay DS620 Slim, but at least it's more spec'd out with the additional two drive bays and a better CPU and more RAM and a one terabyte cache drive and with more potential and expandability than the DS620 Slim. But the question is, does it work? Because I still had my doubts with that CWDOK motherboard. So the first thing I wanted to do was install the CPU fan onto the motherboard along with the thermal paste. And then I replaced the Johnsbo case fans with the two quieter Noctua fans and then included the box, some additional cables to make the fans even quieter. And because the SATA ports were numbered on the SATA backplane of the case, the SATA ports on the motherboard also had labels. It was very easy to install the six piece SATA cable to match the numbers. RAM and SSD was very easy enough to slot into the motherboard in their designated areas. I'd say the tricky part was connecting the cables from the Johnsbo case to the motherboard because you don't get much documentation or manuals from the motherboard or the Johnsbo case. And since the case has a few IO ports on the front and their corresponding cables, the only one I managed to plug in and probably the most important was the power button or the F panel cable. That goes right in the corner of the motherboard next to the 24 pin power socket. And you may just see the world's smallest FP label to let you know. Now to install the power supply, the Johnsbo case has a frame or mounting bracket for the PSU, which I think is easier to remove, then screw it onto the power supply and then back onto the case. The 24 pin power cable goes into the motherboard. Another cable goes into the SATA backplane to power the hard drives. And the one I missed, which was causing the fans to stop and start, with a CPU fan power. Now the Corsair power supply did have a cable, but it was labeled CPU, but that was an eight pin and the CPU fan was a four pin. I thought I messed up with the power supply and needed to buy another cable, but turns out that the eight pin can be converted to a four pin just by unclipping them apart. Now I did do some cable management. Now don't get too excited. I just used a cable tie and shoved the other unused cables from the Johnsbury case down to the area of the backplane. And to my relief on boot up, I was pleasantly surprised with the bias, so all was looking good so far. Now with the hard drive, Johnsbury provide these handles. Let me just open this panel for you. Hopefully you can see that. And it's probably the only thing I'm not a huge fan of. They're just too flimsy. The issue is when it comes to pulling the hard drives out, having this flexible rubber material doesn't give you that much tension, but fortunately, you don't have to do it that often. Now in terms of software, NAS software, there are a few choices and the popular ones are TrueNAS and Unraid. I won't go into detail on differences between the two, both are very good systems. TrueNAS is open source and free. Unraid is not free. I went with Unraid. Why? Because it easily allows you to mix and match hard disk drive sizes as and when you please. Unraid do offer a 30 day free trial and the cheapest license currently is $50. Now that's a one-time purchase, not a subscription with free upgrades for a year. And something you need to be aware of when you set up your hard disks and you want some data protection, which I presume you want, you have to select one hard drive as the parity drive. So that disk is reserved for data protection and data loss. And that parity drive has to be equal to or be the largest among your set of hard disks. So I've got two eight terabyte drives. One will be my parity drive and the other will be for storage. And any other disks I add on have to be less or equal to eight terabytes. So say if I saw a great deal for 10 terabyte drive and I wanted to add it to my NAS, I then have to replace the current eight terabyte drive with the 10 terabyte drive and the system would need to rebuild the parity onto the new terabyte drive, which would take some time. But anything less than eight terabyte, it can just be added as part of my array pool. And something else you should be aware of with Unraid, Unraid runs on a USB stick. So make sure you get a good quality USB stick. I'll leave a link in the description for some recommended USB drives from the community. 
And conveniently, the CWK motherboard has an internal USB slot to keep things a little bit neater. And to improve file transfer speeds, this is where that one terabyte SSD drive comes in handy. It acts as my cache for speedier or perceived speedier file transfers. Now, having used Synology's disk manager software and using Unraid for a bit, Synology is definitely more user-friendly. You get a very nice OS feel in a web interface and it's very easy to navigate around. You can browse your files, manage your settings, install apps from the package manager center, draggable windows, all the bells and whistles you get and with the illusion that it's an OS and a web interface. Whereas Unraid, you get a nice web interface, but you're not gonna get that operating system vibe. It does have a very nice landing page with stats about your system and an area showing what docking containers you're running. But for instance, it doesn't have a way to browse your files out of the box. Well, you can launch the terminal and browse that way. Otherwise, you have to install a third-party software such as Dynamics File Manager. And there are plenty of apps in the Unraid community. And that's what I like about Unraid. One which I particularly like is Nextcloud, a recommendation from the brother-in-law. It's like Dropbox, but self-hosted. And I've started to play around with PhotoPrism as a central storage for all my photos. Now, in terms of how quiet the system is with the Noctua fans, well, I think it's quiet, but you tell me. So is it worth it? Building versus buying, I think ultimately it'd be down to you. I think buying has its advantages. You get a system straight out of the box. There's a little bit of setup initially, but you'll be up and running in minutes. There's a large community, especially in the Synology space, but there can be some restrictions when it comes to particular software and apps and finer controls and configurations because you are tied down to Synology's operating system. And for some of that convenience, I guess you'll pay for that premium. And Synology do build good NAS systems, whereas building your own, you can build a NAS to your specification and have some control over budget and progressively upgrade as and when you please. And you'll have a bit more choice and freedom when it comes to software and apps. You won't be tied down to proprietary software. And hopefully with an eight drive bay like this, I won't be needing to upgrade anytime soon. All right, thanks for watching. Hope you found it useful or entertaining. See you on the next one.